Oh my god, this is gonna suck. Spider-Man 3 is the perfect example of a franchise invoking the dreaded trilogy curse. Spider-Man 3 has received a lot of mixed reception over the years. Some people tend to like it, and some people can't stand it. When I first saw the film opening weekend back in 2007, I generally tolerated the issues that the film has. However, re-watching it over the years, I've come to the realization that Spider-Man 3 is just terrible, with very few redeeming qualities. The biggest problem with Spider-Man 3 is just the sheer amount of plot the film tries to juggle. Let's try laying out the various plot threads that Spider-Man 3 tries to follow up on. First, we have Peter dealing with his relationship with Mary Jane and how he wants to marry her. Mary Jane is trying to deal with her struggling acting career. Harry is dealing with the fact that his father was the Green Goblin and Peter is Spider-Man. At least he is for the first 30 minutes, and then he tries to hook up with MJ before returning to try to make Peter pay for his father's death. On top of that, Peter has a new rival at the Daily Bugle in the form of Eddie Brock, who's trying to beat Peter out for promotion. Brock is also dating, and I use that term loosely, Gwen Stacy, who Peter just happens to be tutoring in Dr. Connor's class. And wouldn't you know it that Gwen's father, Captain Stacy, reveals to Peter that the carjacker from the first movie didn't really shoot Uncle Ben, but rather it was his partner, Flint Margo, who becomes the Sandman. Marco has his own issues trying to get money for his sick daughter, and dealing with his new sand abilities. But wait, there's more! An alien symbiote crashes on Earth, and eventually attaches itself to Peter's costume, which turns him into an emo douchebag. Although he was pretty much a douchebag in the early parts of this movie before he even got the black suit, so I guess all it really did was give him bangs. And now Peter has to deal with all of these problems in addition to the black suit turning him emo. And if things couldn't be more complex, the symbiote eventually attaches itself to Brock, creating Venom. I mean, Jesus H. Christ! All that plot could barely fit into two movies, let alone one. Attempting to try to adapt the black suit and Venom in one film, in addition to all of the other plot details, is just not possible. I mean, even the damn cartoon show spent multiple episodes building Eddie Brock up as a character and his hatred for both Peter and Spider-Man before he eventually became Venom. Also, at least in the cartoon show, the writers had the decent sense to develop the black-suited Spider-Man as an arrogant jerk who pushes away the people that care about him, not this emo-looking, dance-strutting, corny, line-spewing character they got Tobey Maguire to act like. In fact, like I said before, Peter acts like more of a douchebag in his red and blue suit. What with him taking photos, posing for pictures, kissing Gwen, and then there's the dancing. <laughs> What is with the dancing? I mean, is this supposed to be like in the last movie when they played Raindrops Have Fallen on My Head and Peter was acting all happy? Because, you know, that song and scene made sense. You know, it kind of went together. Peter was free of being Spider-Man and was enjoying his life. I mean, sure, it was a bit corny, but at least Peter wasn't Saturday night fevering his way down the streets of Manhattan. I mean, this is the music that should have played over this scene in the movie. No, 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 that's, that's, that's too obvious. Let, let, let's try something a little bit more modern. You know, this scene just needs something as corny as the rest of this movie. Song. 
The other big problem with the film is the dialogue. A lot of the lines sound incredibly corny, and in some cases, they tend to make no sense whatsoever. How's the pie? So good. What does it matter to you anyway? Uh, everything! I'm gonna put some dirt in your eye. You want forgiveness? Get religion. Find us some shade. Thanks, out nice. Also, there are examples of really lazy writing and cheap resolves to plot threads from the first two movies. For example, most fans were wondering how Harry would eventually come to terms with the fact that his father was the Green Goblin and that Peter didn't really mean to kill him. How is this all resolved? A heart-to-heart -heart confession between Peter and Harry? No! The butler confesses to Harry in probably the worst scene in the entire trilogy. The night your father died, I, I cleaned his wound. The blade that pierced his body came from his glider. Really? Harry spends the whole movie not believing Peter, his best friend for years, but he believes the butler who had two scenes in this entire trilogy and has uttered about ten words in that time? And also, what does Bernard mean that he cleaned Norman's wound? I mean, Harry found his father as soon as Spider-Man dropped him off. You're, you're telling me that the audience is meant to believe that Harry didn't just call up the paramedics as soon as Spider-Man left? He forced his manservant to inspect his father's wound? And also, how did Bernard know that Norman was the Green Goblin? He acts like he knows the whole time. I mean, if Bernard knew that Norman was the Green Goblin, why didn't he call call the police or tell somebody. I mean, Norman killed all of the Oscorp board members in the first movie, he almost killed Mary Jane, Aunt May, and a bunch of small children, all in addition to Peter. I mean, all of that could have been averted if Bernard had just said something. So yeah, nice job, asshole. Then there are most of the new characters of this film that are a complete waste of time. In regards to Gwen Stacy, well, I can easily say this. This is the real Gwen Stacy. This person here is just some girl named Gwen Stacy. The real Gwen Stacy is a smart intellectual who's in love with Peter Parker, not some ditzy blonde who has a modeling career and spews out wonderful lines like this. I love the city of New York. I am here today because I fell 62 stories and someone caught me. In regards to the villains... <laughs> Hello everybody, it's time to play Guess Which Character is the Main Villain? Our first contestant is Harry Osborn, aka New Goblin. He's been pissed off at Peter Parker for killing his father, even though he never takes the time to let Peter properly explain. Flying around on a cross between a hoverboard and a snowboard, Harry's powers include augmented strength and having a passion for hard knocks to the head. And for a bonus point, ladies, he can survive taking a live grenade to the face and walking away with nothing but a scar. Our second contestant is Flint Marco, aka Sandman, a small-time crook who may or may not have killed Uncle Ben, and has a daughter who is sick with... something. Marco has been blessed with poor eyesight in order for him to fall into a large open crater which just happened to be the site of a standard late night sand experiment. And thanks to lazy scientists who couldn't be bothered to check why the silicon mass had changed, Marco was infused with sand and given sand-like abilities. Marco has decided to use his abilities to save his daughter. Well, isn't that nice? I mean, Marco's got some high morals since to him, stealing and hurting innocent people is alright, just as long as you do it to cure a sick family member. And finally, there's Eric Foreman, <coughs> Eddie, Eddie Brock, aka Venom. Brock is Peter's rival at the Daily Bugle and is deluded enough to think that he's dating Gwen Stacy. Brock has his life completely ruined by Peter as he goes out with Gwen, who wasn't really interested in Brock anyway, and also gets him fired from the Daily Bugle. Though Brock gets his revenge when the alien symbiote bonds to him and they become Venom. Not that you'd know that because the film never actually names him. Venom has all the abilities of Spider-Man with the added ability of not speaking in the third person and ruining a classic character in less than 20 minutes of screen time. So, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you, who is the main villain of Spider-Man 3? Is it A, New Goblin, B, Sandman, or C, Venom, or D, none of the above? If you guessed D, none of the above, well, you're correct, because none of them are well written enough to be considered a main villain. You win a migraine headache and the sense of complete betrayal, which is actually what you'll feel after watching this film. Thanks for playing! Also, I have a question, like I mentioned before, why is Peter such a douchebag at the beginning of the film before he even gets the black suit? I mean, seriously, he treats Mary Jane like crap, brushing her off and barely caring about how she feels. And then there's this scene. They love me. I mean, Peter has no reason to be this selfish. In fact, this film could have easily used all of these scenes when Peter is under the influence of the black suit. The only thing really worth watching Spider-Man 3 4 is the action scenes, which are really well done. I mean, the special effects are really great, particularly during the scene when Flint Marco becomes Sandman. And the end finale is also really good in terms of action. Though I still tend to have issues with Harry jumping in front of Peter to stop Venom from impaling him. 
I'm just saying, Peter was tied to the ground only by his arms, and he could have easily jumped over Venom or out of the way, or Harry could have just tackled Venom in midair. Th though I really love the look on Maguire's face here. I mean, he's probably supposed to look like he's in shock, but even Peter is appalled by how stupid Harry is. I feel like dialogue could have been added in these few minutes. Dude, I totally saved your life. Uh, Harry, I could have just jumped over him. In fact, I did a similar move to Bonesaw McGruff in the first movie. Oh. You know, this really hurts. Yeah, looks like it. Okay. I'll be back in The Amazing Spider-Man 2! Though the climax is almost ruined by the constant damn news coverage. I mean, it's okay during the first scene in order to get Peter to become aware of the situation, but why do we still need it during the fight? I mean, the coverage is just telling us what we can clearly see. Are the filmmakers so dense that they had to create characters in the film to tell us how to feel? Like, why does this guy have to say, this could be the end of Spider-Man? I mean, why not just show the people in the crowd looking upset? In fact, the scene where Peter reaches out to Mary Jane while getting pummeled by Sandman is all you really need to show in order to depict just how desperate the situation is for him. I mean, but the biggest disappointment is that you can tell that the film seemed to have some sort of an idea of the story and themes it wanted to focus on. I mean, the general theme of revenge and the ability to make the right choices, even under the most dire of circumstances, is a great theme to pair along with the story arc involving the black suit. In fact, Peter's final narration at the funeral might be the best couple of lines this whole film has. Whatever battle we have raging inside us, we always have a choice. My friend Harry taught me that. He chose to be the best of himself. It's the choices that make us who we are. And we can always choose to do what's right. It's just a shame that the whole two hours before these lines don't deserve to be associated with them. I mean, Spider-Man 3 is just a mess from start to finish. The simplest reason to explain this is that the film has just got too much going on. I mean, had Spider-Man 3 just focused on one villain or even two, the film wouldn't seem like the muddled mess that it is. Spider-Man 3 is entertaining thanks to the action scenes, but as a trilogy-ending film, it fails to really close the book on the franchise. A lot of people feel like there was a lot of behind-the-scenes issues that caused some of these problems, like the producers wanting Venom and Sam Raimi not wanting him and only wanting Sandman and Vulture. I mean, who knows what really caused all these problems? We'll never get a straight answer, but at least Sam Raimi was smart enough not to allow the producers to turn Spider-Man 4 into another unholy mess. At least there, he refused to go along with it, and then the film got cancelled. And as it goes in Hollywood, when a film franchise gets cancelled, the easiest thing to do is reboot! And we'll be looking at that reboot next time, when we look at The Amazing Spider-Man.